Hello, welcome to the channel. If you're returning, it's good to see you again. And if you're new here, then I will introduce myself. I am the ASMR historian, helping you fall asleep or just helping you relax and learn something new. Today we're going to continue our theme, which is the discussion of Bronze Age societies and all the eccentricities that go along with the old world. So if you would like to find an appropriate setting to relax and perhaps switch off for a moment, unwind from the day, then we can begin discussing today's topic of ancient Egyptian funerary practices. Ancient Egyptians practiced elaborate funerary rituals for post-mortem immortality. These involved mummification, spell casting, and burying specific grave goods deemed essential for the afterlife. Over time, ancient Egyptian burial customs evolved and changed discarding old practices and adopting new ones. Despite these changing specifics, body preparation, magic rituals, and grave goods remained integral to a proper Egyptian funeral. In the absence of written records from Egypt's pre-dynastic period, which is circa 6000 to 3150 before the Common Era. Scholars posit that cultural emphasis on body preservation originated during that time. Interestingly, unlike neighboring cultures, early Egyptians opted for burial over cremation. This was possibly due to a belief that mistreating the deceased could actually lead to their resurrection. Of course, if you were burned alive and had the chance to get back at the person who did it, you'd certainly be taking your chance to do so. Initially, early burials were rather simple and uncomplicated. They featured shallow oval pits containing minimal burial goods. Intriguingly, some graves accommodated multiple individuals and animals. Over time, however, burial practices evolved, with bodies initially placed in wicker baskets and progressing to wooden or terracotta coffins. The apex of this evolution was, of course, the use of the sarcophagus, which is what we're quite familiar when we think about a royal burial, or perhaps the burial of somebody with quite a lot of monetary resources when we think of the ancient Egyptians. These elaborate tombs, like the sarcophagi, were adorned with an array of burial goods, such as intricate jewelry, provisions like food or perhaps of water, engaging games, and even sharpened splints. This progression in burial practices reflects a complex interplay of cultural, religious, and social factors that shaped the Egyptian funerary customs and traditions over many thousands of years and through many changes in cultural and religious dynamic. From the pre-dynastic era to the concluding Ptolemaic dynasty, the Ptolemaic dynasty was the Greek dynasty Ancient Egyptians maintained an enduring cultural emphasis on eternal life and the conviction of personal existence beyond death. This profound belief in an afterlife is 
evident in the practice of interring grave goods alongside the deceased in tombs. The Egyptian concept of an afterlife gained widespread recognition through trade and cultural exchanges, leaving a lasting impact on various civilizations and religions. The Silk Road was notably one of the things that facilitated the dissemination of these beliefs, all the way from the furthest eastern frontiers to the west around the Levant. Central to Egyptian beliefs was a notion that entry into the afterlife hinged on an individual's ability to fulfill a promise in that realm. For instance, the king was deemed eligible for the afterlife based on their role as a ruler of Egypt, interpreting leadership as a qualification for admission in the afterlife. So let's think about if you were a carpenter. Well, of course, they would need carpenters in the afterlife. If you were a bread maker or a brewer, well, of course, they would need them as well. So I'm sure that if you had some useful skills, you were invited to the party. This perspective on the afterlife permeated Egyptian culture and it was just another one of those things that contributed to its influence on a broader historical and geographical scale. The concept of serving a purpose in the afterlife was reinforced through human sacrifices, which were discovered in early royal tombs, intended to accompany the king into the afterlife. Unfortunately, if you were working for the king or was one of his slaves, then you may perhaps find yourself following him down into that tomb. Not the best retirement plan in ancient Egypt at all. No paid overtime either for that one. Of course, over time, this practice evolved as it was somewhat unpopular and figurines, as well as paintings, gradually replaced the human victims. Some figurines were likely crafted to resemble specific individuals, symbolizing their journey to join the king in the afterlife. Both the lower and noble classes sought the king's favor, believing that deceased kings transformed into deities capable of granting an afterlife to chosen individuals. This belief persisted from the pre-dynastic period all the way through to the Old Kingdom. While many spells from preceding texts were retained, the introduction of new spells in the coffin texts aim to make the funerary text more relevant to the nobility. In the first intermediate period, the significance of the king diminished somewhat, and funerary texts, once exclusive only to royalty, became more accessible to those with the resources to procure them. Kings transitioned from god-kings to rulers of the population, losing the exclusive privilege of an afterlife solely based on their royal status alone. No free rides anymore. Now this shift was something that was very important indeed. This shift marked a change in the role of kings, who were now regarded as mortal rulers in the afterlife. So let's go all the way back to that prehistoric period that we mentioned. Really archaic 
and try to piece together the origins of Egyptian funerary customs. Among the earliest burial sites in ancient Egypt are associated with the Merimde culture, and that dates back all the way to 4800 to 4300 BC. Located in the Nile Delta, which is up in the north of country, near modern-day Alexandria, the much nicer place to live away from the desert, the Merimde people are recognized for crafting clay figurines. However, they did not include grave goods or offerings in their burials. The villages of Omari and Mardi, situated near present-day Cairo, provide the first evidence of funerals in Egypt with said grave goods. In these locations, the deceased were interred in simple, round graves, accompanied by a pot. During this early period, the bodies were not specially treated or arranged, and without written records, of course, little is known about the contemporary beliefs in the afterlife. The time is quite a mystery to us, and we're left to piece the story together through what archaeological remains we still have. The inclusion, however, of a single pot in the grave suggests a possible provision of food for the deceased. Funerary customs in ancient Egypt evolved from the pre-dynastic period building upon practices from the prehistoric era. Now initially, during the Badarian period, which is around 4400 to 3800 before our common era, people continued the tradition of excavating round graves containing a single pot resembling customs from the Omari and Mahdi cultures. As the pre-dynastic period progressed, rectangular graves became more prevalent, and additional objects were deposited with the deceased. Evidence suggests ritual practices during the Nakada II period, from around 3650 to 3300 BCE including specific body arrangements, often crouched with the face oriented towards the east or the west, and, of course, artistic depictions of funeral processions and ritual dancing on painted jars. Social stratification began to emerge, with some graves containing more elaborate goods than others. There were also gender distinctions that surfaced, with weapons often included in men's graves, and cosmetic palettes in women's graves. That's right, we had cosmetics all the way back in those times. I suppose women always want to look their best, even after they're dead. By 3600 BCE, the practice of mummification had commenced, something a little more recognizably ancient Egyptian, involving the wrapping of the dead in linen bandages infused with embalming oils, such as conifer resin and aromatic plant extracts. And of course, these new distinctions lead us to the early dynastic period where we start to see more tombs and even coffins emerge. During the first dynasty in ancient Egypt, a notable shift occurred in burial practices, reflecting the rising wealth and social status of some individuals. Wealthy Egyptians, instead of simple pit graves, constructed rectangular mud-brick tombs with underground burial chambers. These were known as mastabas. 
these mastabas featured niched walls, adopting the palace facade motive that imitated the walls surrounding the king's palace. While both commoners and kings had mastaba tombs, the architecture suggested that, in death, some affluent individuals achieved an elevated status. In later periods, a strong association between the deceased and the god of the dead, Osiris, became evident. Grave goods evolved during the First Dynasty to include a wide array of items, such as furniture, jewellery, games, weapons, cosmetic palettes, and decorated jars with food supplies. The wealthiest tombs boasted thousands of grave goods, and newly invented coffins were crafted specifically for burial. While evidence for the mummification during this period is inconclusive, daily life objects in the tombs indicated Egyptians' anticipation for the need of such items in the afterlife. Continuity from life to the afterlife was emphasized through the positioning of tombs. Those who served the king during their lifetimes chose burials near the king to showcase their sense of loyalty and continuity. The use of a stele in front of tombs started in the first dynasty reflected a desire to personalize the tomb with the deceased's name, marking a shift towards individualized funerary practices. During the Old Kingdom period in ancient Egypt, a significant evolution in funerary practices occurred. Kings began constructing pyramids as their tombs, surrounded by stone mastabas for high officials. This arrangement not only reflected the hierarchy, but also served as family ceremonies. Given that many high officials were royal relatives. Among the elite, mummification had also become prevalent, involving the wrapping of bodies in linen bandages, sometimes covered with moulded plaster. Stone sarcophagi or plain wooden coffins housed the mummies, and by the end of the Old Kingdom, mummy masks in cartonage appeared. Canopic jars were introduced to hold internal organs and amulets made of gold, faience and carnelian, designed to protect different body parts, also showed up during this time. Inscriptions inside the coffins of the elite marked a notable shift during the Old Kingdom providing a glimpse into the deceased's identity. Reliefs depicting everyday items adorn tomb walls, supplementing grave goods through visual representation. The introduction of the false door, a non-functioning stone sculpture, either inside the temple or outside the mastaba, became a focal point for offerings and prayers. Statues of the deceased gained prominence in tombs, serving ritual purposes. The burial chambers of private individuals started receiving decorations, a trend that expanded beyond the temples. Towards the end of the Old Kingdom, burial chamber decorations featured offerings, but lacked depictions of people this reflected a new and nuanced approach to afterlife symbolism. The first intermediate period in Egypt, marked by a fragmented political landscape, is mirrored in diverse local art and burial styles. 
Various regional influences are evident in the ornamentation of coffins, showcasing distinct origins. Coffin inscriptions tend to differ quite a lot, with some featuring concise one-line texts, and common motives include depictions of the Wajet eyes, symbolizing protection. Regional nuances extend to the hieroglyphs adorning coffins, adding layers to the identification of artistic origins. In burial practices, men occasionally had tools and weapons interred with them, underscoring associations with combat roles. Conversely, women's graves included jewelry, cosmetic items like mirrors and grindstones, suggesting preparation tools for the afterlife, akin to the aforementioned weaponry in men's tombs, hinting at expected roles of battle. This period's funerary customs reflect the dynamic socio-political landscape of the time. Heading into the Middle Kingdom in ancient Egypt, burial customs were influenced by political shifts, in the 11th dynasty, tombs were carved into the Theban mountains or local cemeteries in Upper and Middle Egypt. The preference for Thebes as a burial site was aligned with the king's affiliation with this city. However, during the 12th dynasty, high officials of the ruling family in Lisht chose Mastaba tombs near the pyramids in the north. The shift was due to the ruler's new northern origin and different topography. For those below royal courtiers in the 11th dynasty, tombs were more modest. Coffins ranged from simple wooden boxes to linen-wrapped mummies, sometimes adorned with a cartonage mummy, mummy mask. Lower-ranking tombs included wooden shoes, a small statue, and basic food offerings like bread, dried beef, and beer. While jewellery was infrequent, non-elite graves occasionally featured wooden models depicting boats, food production, craftsmen, and various professions. Now remember when we talked about the first intermediate period trends and those prehistoric trends of having something to do in the afterlife? Well, it seems there were many people who still believed in that. In the 12th dynasty, rectangular coffins featured short inscriptions and depictions of essential offerings for the deceased. Men's coffins depicted weapons, symbols of office, and food, while women's coffins featured mirrors, sandals, and jars of food and drink. Some coffins contained texts resembling later pyramid texts. Early faience models of mummies hinted at the future use of Shabdi figurines, and we'll get to them later. Although they lacked the work directive found in later versions. Wealthy individuals had stone figurines resembling Shanti's, possibly serving as mummy substitutes. Well, when we talk about Shanti's, these were the little figurines you could bring with yourself to help you out with things in the afterlife. So let's say you bought your little figurine of the bread maker who you like, and you bought the figurine of the guy who swept the floors for you. You could bring them all with you, and they'd be right there in the afterlife, sweeping the floor and baking the bread and all sorts of other things that you, as a noble with the money to have a tomb, would be not so accustomed to doing yourself. 
by the later 12th dynasty under King Senwasret III, 1836 to 1818 BCE. Burial practices underwent more changes, at this time rather significant ones. Strangely enough, the body was placed on its back, departing from the traditional side position. This was very different and quite unorthodox for many people at the time. Coffin texts and wooden models disappeared completely, replaced by heart scarabs and mummy-shaped figurines in the burials. Coffin decorations were also simplified, and the 13th dynasty witnessed more diverse motifs in the north and south, reflecting decentralized governance. A notable increase in multiple burials in a single tomb occurred, indicating more equitable wealth distribution and the reuse of tombs across generations. Graves dating from the Second Intermediate Period indicate the burial of non-Egyptians in the region. In the north, graves linked to the Hyksos, a Western Semitic people who governed the north and northeast delta, consist of small mud brick structures containing bodies, pottery vessels, and daggers in the men's graves, and nearby donkey burials as well. Of course, it's quite an important animal that's been helping us out for so many years. The donkey hardly gets the credit that it deserves. Pan-shaped graves found in various regions are believed to belong to Nubian soldiers, Nubia being the southern part of uh, the Nile, and they featured ancient customs with shallow round pits, contracted bodies, and minimal food offerings in pots. The occasional inclusion of identifiable Egyptian materials from the Second Intermediate Period distinguishes these burials from earlier periods, including the pre-dynastic era. In the New Kingdom, elite tombs transition to rock-cut chambers, with kings interred in multi-roomed tombs in the Valley of the Kings, instead of pyramids. And I certainly hope that you've watched my Valley of the Kings video. It was great. Funerary rites were conducted by priests in stone temples on the west bank of the Nile, opposite Thebes. The 18th dynasty marked the last period where Egyptians regularly included daily life objects in their tombs. The 19th dynasty saw a shift to tombs containing items specifically crafted for the afterlife, forming a division in burial traditions. Elite tombs in the 18th dynasty featured furniture, clothing, and other earthly possessions, while the 19th dynasty leaned towards items made for the afterlife. Although the Ramesside period lacked surviving unplundered elite tombs, those decorated during this time focused on religious scenes, emphasizing the funeral ceremony funerary meals, deity worship, and underworld figures. Objects discovered in the Ramesses tombs were primarily crafted for the afterlife, with jewellery possibly also used during earthly life. And if you're still here now, I would like to remind you that if you're enjoying the video, it would make my day and give me that little dopamine hit if you were to like and subscribe, and perhaps leave your comments down below. Thank you very much. Now, back to the video. In the late period, non-royal elite burials saw the introduction of large-scale, temple-like tombs, 
although most of tombs were like shafts in the desert floor. Reflecting old kingdom styles, fine statuary and reliefs were common, with grave goods often crafted specifically for the tomb. Coffins continued to bear religious texts and scenes, and personalized shafts featured stelae with the deceased's name and personal prayers of their choice. Shabtis in faience, non-functional canopic jars, staves, scepters, wooden figures of deities, scarabs, jed columns, eye of Horus amulets, and images of the bar were also included. Tools for the tomb's ritual, such as the opening of the mouth ceremony along with magical bricks at the compass points, could be part of the burial as well. Substances recovered from Saqqara, embalming workshops, dated back to the 26th dynasty, included acid extracts rather of juniper berries, cypress, cedar trees, Dead Sea bitumen locally produced animal fats and beeswax, and ingredients from distant places like Elam and Damar from Southeast Asia. Specific substances like pistachio resin and castor oil were used for head treatments. Ancient Greek historian Herodotus from the 5th century and Diodorus Sicilus from the 1st century BC respectively offer extensive insights into how the ancient Egyptians undertook the preservation of deceased bodies. Prior to embalming a practice aimed at delaying or preventing decay, mourners, particularly for high status individuals, would apply mud to their faces and engage in a town procession while expressing their grief. If the wife of a high-status man had passed away, her body would not go under embalming procedures until three or four days later to protect it from potential mistreatment. In cases of drowning or attacks, immediate and meticulous embalming restricted to priests was considered a sacred practice for death deemed venerable. Following the embalming process, mourners potentially participated in a ritual reenactment of judgment during the hour vigil. Volunteers took on the roles of Osiris, his adversary Set, and various other deities like Isis, Nephthys, Horus, Anubis, and Toth. This narrative involves Set's envy of his brother Osiris leading to a plot to kill him. Isis, Osiris's wife, engaged in a struggle with Set to acquire Osiris's body, resulting in the loss of Osiris's spirit. However, Osiris luckily experienced resurrection and was reinstated as a god. Additionally, various funerary processions occurred in the nearby necropolis, symbolizing distinct sacred journeys. The funeral procession came to the tomb, typically involved cattle pulling the body in a sledge-like carrier, accompanied by friends and family. Although the procession threw out a priest would burn incense and pour milk before the deceased. Upon reaching the tomb, symbolizing the transition to the afterlife, the priest conducted the opening of the mouth ceremony on the deceased. With the deceased's head facing south, the body was envisioned in a statue replica. The act of opening the mouth symbolized granting the person the ability to speak and defend themselves during the judgment process. The ceremony concluded with the offering of goods to the deceased. Preserving the deceased's body was crucial for the possibility of entering the afterlife. In ancient Egyptian beliefs, the soul, 
known as Ka, symbolizing vitality, departs the body upon death. Only through a specific embalming process does Ka return to the deceased body, allowing for rebirth. The embalmers followed a systematic approach to prepare the body for mummification, offering various options for the family and friends to choose from, varying in price. Subsequently, the body was taken to Ibwa, meaning the place of purification, a tent for washing, and then to Pernefer, or the house of beauty, for the mummification process. To achieve eternal life and stand before Osiris in the afterlife, ancient Egyptians practiced mummification, a process that involved preserving the body using natron, a natural salt found in Wadi Natron. The dehydration process, lasting up to 70 days, was a crucial step. Special priests, acting as embalmers, treated and wrapped the body in preparation for burial. Mummification, of course, was available to those who could afford it, but it was believed that even without this process, individuals could still enjoy the afterlife, if only they recite the correct spells and prayers. There were three different mummification processes, varying in their cost and complexity. The most classic and expensive method dating back to the 18th dynasty, involved removing internal organs and liquefying the brain. The organs, including the lungs, liver, stomach and intestines, were placed in canopic jars featuring the heads of protective deities. These jars were either buried with the mummified body or returned to the body after cleaning. The body cavity was cleansed stitched with aromatic plants, and filled with bags of natron for dehydration over 40 days. The heart remained in the body for judgment against the feather of Mart in the afterlife. And that's the hard part, the boss fight of Egyptian religion. The subsequent 30 days of the mummification process marked the transformation of the deceased into a semi-divine being. Anything left from the first part was removed, and the body was treated with wine and oils, both for ritual purposes and to prevent damage during wrapping. Golden resin was applied to protect against bacteria and insects, inspired by the belief that divine beings having a flesh of gold. The body was then wrapped in linen strips with amulets, adhered using gum. A priest recited prayers and burned incense during this process. The wrapping provided physical protection, and wealthier families might include an ornamented funeral mask and shroud. Special attention was given to the head, hands, feet, and genitals, often revealed by extra wrappings. Small wooden name tags tied around the neck identified the mummies. The 70-day process was linked to Osiris and the absence of the star Sothis from the sky. The second, moderately expensive mummification option avoided abdominal incisions and organ removal. Cedar oil was injected into the body to prevent liquid from leaving. After a period in natron, the oil and liquefying organs were drained, leaving only skin and bones. The remains were then return to the family, and the family could decide what to do next with them. The cheapest method, option C, chosen by the poor, involved purging the internal organs and laying the body in natron for 70 days before returning it to the family. 
It's the wish.com version of mummification. After mummification, a priest performed the opening of the mouth ceremony, symbolically reanimating the mummy using spells and a ceremonial adze. Spells could also be recited to animate specific body parts. The embalmer's king's body was then moved to the mortuary temple where rituals and prayers prepared him for the afterlife. Placed inside the pyramid with provisions, the king's tomb was then sealed. And those kings, now becoming deities, could be worshipped in their nearby temples. You could see them whenever you wanted. In the ancient times, Egyptians were buried directly in the ground, often in a compact position benefiting from the hot and dry weather that facilitated preservation. Burial in that ancient time was seen as crucial for a comfortable afterlife. Egyptians believed that deceased retained emotions, supporting and caring for their living family. The bar and car, invisible twins, played a role, with the bar supporting the family and the car recognizing the returning twin. This reverence for the deceased led to respectful treatment all around. Less fortunate Egyptians sought proper burials, typically in the desert. Bodies were wrapped in cloth and buried with everyday objects for the most comfort they could get in the afterlife. Poorer individuals often couldn't afford mummification, leading to mass graves without any elaborate items at all. Sites were scattered throughout the desert, some now in populated areas. The ancient Egyptians placed mummies in wooden coffins during the Old Kingdom, featuring intricate designs. The deceased's title, a list of offerings, a false compartment for the car and painted eyes. Middle Kingdom coffins resembled miniature tombs, adorned with images of goddesses like Isis and Nephthys, the four sons of Horus, and of course, the relevant prayers that one would need to be armed with. Anthropoid coffins, moulded to the body's shape, had personalised paintings of the deceased's face and hair. Sarcophagi, large stone containers, housed these coffins offering additional protection and were seen as aiding the deceased in the afterlife. Ancient Egyptians incorporated funerary boats into some burials, considering them essential for deities' travel between the sky and the netherworld. These boats, often made of wood and tightly bound papyrus reeds, served various purposes. Some were used for pilgrimages to holy sites like Abydos, while others, like the one near Khufu's Old Kingdom Pyramid, were associated with royal burials. The River Nile was a common route for these funeral boats, carrying coffins and sometimes including a dog believed to guide the deceased to the afterlife. While smaller boats were common, monumental kings like Khufu had larger ones, with his measuring around 144 feet long, and it had 12 oars. That's a pretty good boat. The Ure Museum houses a representative Egyptian funerary boat symbolizing the journey from the life to the afterlife, particularly across the symbolic Nile River. This specific boat from the tomb of the officials at Beni Hassan became a part of the museum collection in 1923. Well, I suppose there's one thing that Britain did not take back to the British Museum. Well done. And on that note, we finish our video 
for this evening. Well, I think I've done quite well in keeping regular with the uploads. And if you've been listening along and learning a few things, you've done very well too. So please leave your thoughts below in the comments, leave a like on this video, and perhaps consider sharing with your friends so we can all bask together in these glories of the ancient world. I will see you tomorrow for another video, and I will wish you now good night, sweet dreams.